The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. The pictures of Christmas that we have in our minds that are often conjured up by artists, movie makers, sometimes aren't always accurate, are they? Take that stable, for instance. We often picture what with our creches? This, this wooden structure, right? Maybe like a barn of some sort of thing. But the fact is it was probably more like a cold, small, dark cave where they would keep their animals. And that manger that was Jesus' first crib probably wasn't that wooden box that we often picture, but, but probably, at least in that time, made of mud and straw, maybe some stones put in there to give it some stability. And the, the wood feeding box was crude enough, but you think about it being a little trough of mud that Jesus was placed in for his first bed. And when we think about these men that are before us today, there, there's a whole lot of misconceptions there too. This would make a great episode of Mythbusters. I think that show's still around, right? Except you wouldn't have a whole lot of evidence to look at. You have these 12 verses that are right before us here in Matthew chapter 2. It's all we have about these men. But there's so many misconceptions we have in our minds about this account and all the details about it. If you were here for Christmas Eve, we looked at this lesson just very briefly as one of our lessons for that service. And I, and I told you that night about how the wise men, the magi, were not there that evening when Jesus was born. They weren't at the stable, at the manger with, with those shepherds, even though that's what we do with our nativity sets, right? When we were kids, sometimes we'd put those, those magi like in two rooms away because that's about where they were when Jesus was born, right? They were still months from coming to see Jesus. He, he was probably anywhere from six months to maybe up to almost two years old before they came and saw him in that house that they were living in in Bethlehem. Another misconception is that there's three of them. The fact is the Bible doesn't tell us how many there were. There's more than one, that's for sure. It's plural. We often think of three because there were three gifts, but, but there could have been 30 of them. We don't know. Another misconception we often think of, and it, thanks to the Christmas carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are, was that these men were kings. There's no proof of that either. The way the Bible does describe them is using the word magi. It doesn't even call them wise men. That, that's something we've come up with, too. And the word magi comes from the Greek word magoi, which really is more like a magician or an astrologer. And whenever the magoi are talked about in the Bible, they, they aren't usually 
in the greatest light. <laughs> the Apostle Paul comes across a man named Simon the Sorcerer, who is one of these magoi, one of these magi, and he is doing false miracles, trying to lead people away from Jesus. There's also a false prophet named Bar-Jesus in the, in, the epistle, in the Acts as well, in the book of Acts, and he too is one of those magi. Daniel dealt with a lot of magi back in, ba in Babylon, the ones who were trying to discredit him in front of the king, were trying to put down the true God. And maybe that's where these magi here in Matthew 2, who come from the east, have their origins, are from these magoi, these magi of Daniel's time in Babylon, east of Israel. There's a lot of misconceptions we have about these men here. We don't really know how many there were. <laughs> we don't know the exact time that they came to see Jesus. And we really don't know how wise they really were either. <laughs> but they were wise in at least one way. And it wasn't something that they somehow figured out because they were so smart, but something that God revealed to them, miraculously helping them piece together what they saw in these Old Testament scriptures and then connecting it somehow with this star that they saw. And knowing that they should go and follow it for some reason. <laughs> knowing that at the end they would find one that they would present gifts fit for a king. They set off from their home, wherever that was, in the east, on this long journey to find the Messiah. Their king. They followed that star. And friends, that's the encouragement this lesson gives us today, too. To continue to follow that star. And you don't have to travel hundreds of miles to do it. You don't have to be wise in the ways of this world. Instead, we get to continue to follow that star. As they were drawn by its light, we get to be drawn continually by word and sacrament. The light of his word, his means of grace, that, that God says, come and be drawn. Come and know this light and live in this light. Be drawn to it. Continue to follow that star of Jesus. That's what he was called in that lesson from Numbers. Did you catch that? Right? A star will come out of Jacob. That's Jesus. Right? Revelation, it calls Jesus the morning star. Right? That one who brings light into our world. The one who came to bring light into the darkness of our sin and unbelief. Continue to follow that star of Jesus. And we need that reminder, don't we? Because there's so many things that want to lull us and draw us back into the darkness. You've got Satan, who wants nothing more than for you to, to dabble in that darkness. you got nothing, that sinful flesh that lives right inside of you, that still longs, to live in that sinfulness, that evil, that selfishness, that darkness. Friends, we need to continue as we enter into this new year to be encouraged, to be admonished to follow that star and not take our eyes off of Jesus. You know, the Magi are seemingly the only ones who are excited about this star. <laughs> Look closely again at this familiar account. Where do they go first when they arrive in Israel? They go to Jerusalem, the capital city, right, where most of the people lived, where the king was. Well, they figure if, if this star is here and it's announcing the birth of, of a king, of the Messiah, well, then the people in Jerusalem must be all excited about this, right? But, but no one knows anything about it. They're just kind of complacent. No one's excited about what they see. It's just life is normal. Isn't it often that way in our world too? Another Christmas has come and gone. And for many in our world, it was just another normal Christmas. We shouldn't be surprised, should we? 
We heard in our gospel lesson on Christmas Day, the light has shined into the darkness, but the darkness doesn't understand it. And if we're honest with ourselves, how often, too, don't we become just kind of complacent? Maybe for you, another Christmas has passed and you, you're feeling empty. You're feeling sad because it's over. That, that joy that Christmas is to bring to us is, is not in your heart because we become complacent to the message of who this Savior really is and what he comes to do. We've lost the excitement and the joy of the gospel. You look at the religious experts in this account. Right? They don't follow the star. <laughs> they, they know the prophecies. Right? It seems like you know, when they're asked, well, where's the Messiah to be born? They know without even looking it up. Well, Micah says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Right? They know, but, and then the, the Magi go, but they don't go along with the Magi. They stay in Jerusalem. Even the religious leaders, those who know the scriptures by memory, have become complacent and think, oh well. And as Christians, that's an attitude we have to be aware of too, don't we? I know my Bible. I go to church. I give my offerings. Right? To just become complacent in our faith. If I admit it, I'm way too much like these religious leaders who won't travel just a few miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, much less hundreds of miles from the east all the way there when I don't take the time to open up my Bible. Take time to have a devotion. Take time for prayer. How easy it is to be like these religious leaders and just not get overjoyed when you see the star, but be overconsumed by the things of this life. The pleasures, the worries, the concerns. And forget well, who that star is and what that light brings to our lives. You know, there's one person in here who does care about that star, besides the Magi, and that's Herod, right? But, but Herod's not excited about it. He's, he's not complacent about it. He's threatened by it. Because there's this talk of another king, and, and that's a threat to his throne and a threat to his power. But are we sometimes like Herod, too? Where Jesus isn't the star of my life and my heart and the light of my life, he's a threat to my time, to my money to my priorities, right? If I, if I let Jesus in and he really takes control of all of my heart, what does that mean for me? Where does that leave me? Friends, how easily we be can become or begin to see Jesus as a threat. And maybe you don't think about that consciously, but subconsciously, any time that you put your will before God's, any time that you think what you have to do is more important than what he asks you to do, any time that it becomes about my time and my money and my life and my priorities, Jesus has just become a threat to you and to your life. The fact is, friends, that's why we need to continue to keep following the star. So that we don't become complacent. So that we don't think he's just not worth our time. So, so we don't see him as a threat to our lives. But to continue to follow that star that we know. God led those magi right to that house. That star moved in the sky until it was right over that house where Jesus was. And their reaction? They were overjoyed. And friends, that's what God has done for you too. 
You did not find him. He found you. You were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the same God, the same God who knows absolutely everything about you, who knows every single sin that you have done, who knows every time that you have been complacent in your faith, who have said Jesus isn't, isn't worth my time, or have even seen Jesus as a threat to your life and to your priorities, the same God who punishes sinners with eternal death and hell is the same God who loves you. The same God who called you. The same faithful God who forgives you. This same God who is willing to step into our world, to be Emmanuel, to be God with us, to take on flesh, and to take our place to live a life of complete dedication of following his Father's will. All the way to a cross. All the way to suffering and death. Friends, this season of Epiphany, over these next six weeks, we're going to see this Savior, who's just a baby here in this account, revealed to be our Savior. Revealed to be God himself come into this world to bring light and life and peace and joy and forgiveness and salvation. You know him. You've seen him. You've been brought into this marvelous light. May we be given his strength to continue to follow him so you can live in that light right now and you can have that promise of eternal light forever. Friends, if you're questioning it all today, if God loves you, if you're questioning at all today, it, what is my purpose in this life? What is the, the star that I should be following through this life? Don't look to the people of Jerusalem. Don't look to the religious leaders or Herod or even the Magi. Look to the one laying in his mother's arms. Look to that one in that house in Bethlehem. Look to that child, for that is God himself come for you. Look to your Savior. Friends, you may not be wise in the ways of this world, but you have been made wise for salvation through the gift of the Holy Spirit. You may not be kings and queens, but you have been given by God's grace the promise of a crown of life that your Savior himself will place upon your head when this life is over. Friends, you may not be wealthy, but you can drop to your knees and you can offer him your praise and your humble adoration for the riches that he brings to you, the gifts that he gives to you right now and forever. Peace with him. Joy beyond anything this life can give you. The promise of salvation and life with your God. Friends, we've entered into a new year, just a couple days in. And often people will make resolutions at the beginning of the year, right? And do something better or more this year, give something up. I'm not big on resolutions. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But can I encourage you to make one resolution? to continue to follow that star. To make the star of Jesus the center of your heart and of your life, of your time, of your priorities. Make your resolution this new year to continue to keep your eyes focused on that light of Jesus. Be it in worship and receiving the sacrament and being in a Bible study and doing devotions at home so that you can continue to live in that light and have the blessings that that light of Jesus can only bring to your life, that star of your life and your heart and your eternity, it's Jesus. May he grant us the strength and the desire to continue to follow that light every day this new year. God grant it. Amen.